Good evening, beloved, family, and Yahusha, the Messiah. This is Linda Rose, Spirit Song. I'm going to be doing part five of Thy Hidden Ones, The Life of the Believer as Illustrated in the Song of Songs by Jesse Penn Lewis. I will be reading chapters 16 through 18. Let's go ahead and get started. For ye died, and your life is hid with Messiah in Elohim. That is in Colossians 3, 3. The Hidden Life Thou art beautiful, O my love, as Terza, comely, as Yerushalayim, terrible as an army with banners. That's chapter 6 and verse 4. The well-beloved speaks again. The soul rests in him. And for the first time he calls her beautiful. His eyes already behold in her the marks of the bride city, the new Yerushalayim as she will come down out of heaven from Elohim. Revelation 21, 2. In the fullness of time, the hidden one has passed through deep waters in fellowship with her master, and in the consequent brokenness, her spirit has been freed from much that kept her from full knowledge of the life with Messiah in Yahuwah. Now he will teach her how to dwell with him in the Father's bosom and will open to her the life within the veil. In the holiest of all, she knows as never before the priceless value of the blood of Messiah. She has come not only to Mount Zion and unto the heavenly Yerushalayim, but to Yahusha, the Mediator, and to the blood sprinkling. Hebrews 12, 22 through 24. She sees that the way to Yahuwah is a blood sprinkled way. And she knows that through the blood alone can she have liberty and boldness to enter. She is not there by virtue of any past experience of fellowship with the well-beloved in his cross. She draws near only through his blood of propitiation, which he carried within the veil, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Hebrews 9.12 Through that same priceless blood of the Lamb, sprinkled upon the mercy seat, she will be kept abiding in the Shekinah light, sanctified by the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Yahusha, the Messiah. 1 Peter 1, 2. The soul is now a hidden one, and the deepest meaning of the words hidden with Messiah in Elohim. She must go no more out, Revelation 3, 12, until Messiah, who is our life, shall appear, Colossians 3, 4, when she with all who are united to him, shall be manifested with him to the world, partakers of his glory. Following this comparison of his purchased one to the city of the king, we find repeated in the well-beloved's language some characteristics of the new creation. These are set forth in verses 5 through 7 and parallel his loving description given previously in chapters 4, 1 through 5. When she was first brought into union with him as the risen one, and then into the communion of the heavenlies, some changes and omissions in using the same figures shows us that she is reaching full growth and is of ripe age to receive the fullness of Messiah. Ephesians 4.13, and to be taught her heavenly calling more fully by him, 
so that he may be able to fulfill in her every good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. 2 Thessalonians 1.11 The Worship Within the Veil Turn away thine eyes from me, for they have overcome me, or make me afraid. Chapter 6, verse 5 The first time the well-beloved called his redeemed one fair was when he saw the holy dove shining through her eyes, the windows of the soul. 1, verse 15 And this thought was repeated in verse 4, I mean chapter 4, verse 1. Now to his purchased one brought into assured union with him, he speaks again of her eyes, but with an entire change of expression. Turn away thine eyes is his new request. She is in the place of worship and the holiest of all. The seraphim covered their faces as they cried, Holy, holy, holy is Yahuwah Satbayot, that means of hosts. And I will say, beloved, that holy is Kadosh. Kadosh. Kadosh is Yahuwah Satbayot. Isaiah 6, 3. A covered face is the appropriate attitude of worship in the presence of a holy Elohim reverence, and awe of the Most High must be the marks of the soul admitted to the holy place. Turn away thine eyes from me, for they have overcome me. Literally, that means have taken me by storm. In her access to the throne of Elohim, she is in the place of power. For the eyes of the surrendered one turned toward him and helpless weakness and dependence have power with Yahuwah Elohim. The well-beloved is overcome, conquered by the speechless cry of one look of appeal from his hidden ones, so that he is constrained to answer, Here I am, and to interpose on their behalf in every conflict. Thus are the hidden ones made, quote, unquote, terrible, as an army with banners, as they have power and prevail with him who is a great Elohim, a mighty and a terrible. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 10, verse 17. Terrible as they advance from his holy place, or holy places, Psalm 68, 35, to the hosts of darkness. Turn away thine eyes from me, for they make me afraid whispered the well-beloved. And Yahuwah said unto Moshe, Go, charge the people, lest they break through unto Yahuwah to gaze, and many them of them perish. And a second time he said, Go, let the priests and the people break through unto Yahuwah, lest he break forth upon them. Exodus nineteen twenty-one and verse 24. For Yahuwah was afraid for the people, lest they should not understand his terrible holiness, and should gaze and perish. No man could see his face and live. Exodus 33, 20. Before I go on, I find this quite fascinating, considering the video that I just put up about his name is in the breath, and how concerning that name of how holy he is and that it has been concealed. And I believe it's for the very things that I'm just reading right now. This, I didn't read on ahead. For me, this is a confirmation of what the Ruach has shown me concerning why his name is not being revealed until the end. And we are in that place of the end. Just something to contemplate and think about. Be not high-minded, but fear, O child of Elohim, for your Elohim is a consuming fire. 
Take heed that you cover your face and walk in awe of the Most High as you seek to abide in His holy and set-apart presence and remember your ceaseless need of the blood sprinkling which speaks for you upon the mercy seat as you walk in the light of Yahuwah. The well-beloved's words, turn away thine eyes from me, may also be taken to signify in the case of the soul united to him, a maturity of faith that can walk blindfolded with Elohim, Isaiah 42, 19, knowing him so well that it is content to trust him without sight, not seeking to pry into his dealings within in experience or without in his providence, like a restless child who wants to know before it can trust its father. The soul that truly knows Elohim can wait until he pleases to reveal his purposes. It may also be suggested that the well-beloved bids the soul turn away her direct gaze from him because at this stage she is one with him and should take the appropriate attitude of oneness, not directing her eyes toward him as if she were separate from him, but so abiding in him that he can enable her to look through his eyes and from his standpoint at what he pleases. Wow. I just have to take the time to really let that, that is so beautiful. Thank you, Father. The strength of the hidden one. Thy hair is as a flock of goats that lie along the side of Gilead. Chapter 6, verse 5. The words of chapter 4, verse 1 are exactly repeated to signify that the strength of the new creation in childhood and maturity remains the same. That is, it has none in itself but all in, El in Elohim. The goats upon Mount Gilead climb and feed where none other can find a footing. So, this soul finds all strength in Yahuwah, and she is able to say, I can do all things through Messiah, which strengthens me. Philippians 4, 13. Now, as in its childhood, the secret of the manifestation of that strength lies in separation to Elohim and in abiding in him in helpless weakness. The renewed mind of the hidden one. Thy teeth are like a flock of ooze. Come up from the washing. None is bereaved among them. Chapter 6, verse 6. The mind or mental powers are again described under the figure of teeth, and the glorious master repeats his previous description. See chapter 4, verse 2, omitting only that the flock has been newly shorn. The understanding has needed continuous separation from the intrusion of the wisdom of, of Elohim. Therefore, it is said to be come up from the washing, the washing of water by the word. Ephesians 5, 26. Only thus can the mind be continually renewed and be kept so clear and empty that it may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding to walk worthily of Yahuwah, bearing fruit and increasing in the knowledge of Elohim, Colossians 1, 9 through 10. The hidden glory of the soul in union. Thy temples are like a pomegranate behind thy veil, chapter 6, verse 7. Again, the well-beloved repeats exactly his words of chapter 4, verse 3 showing the life to be a hidden one at every stage. The skin of the pomegranate hides its beautiful interior, which is only seen when cut and laid open. The king's daughter is all glorious within, 
by the grace of his presence. But all that she, all that she is, is in him. As she is accepted in the beloved, is veiled to a great extent by the earthly house of the body of humiliation. When Mashiach, who is her life, shall be manifested, then shall she also appear with him in glory, and then shall he be marveled at in all them that believe. Meanwhile, the high and heavenly calling of the bridal soul is hidden, yet shown through a simple and lowly exterior. It is written of the only begotten of the Father, Yahusha, knowing that the Father has given all things into his hands, and that he came forth from Elohim and goes back unto Yahuwah Elohim, began to wash the disciples' feet, John 13, 3 through 5. When the creature life seeks to be conformed to the divine and to be Messiah-like, it stoops because it ought, even when contrary to its likings, but does so with an effort. But the spirit of Yahusha enables the soul to take the lowest place easily, unconsciously, quietly, and habitually by the power of the indwelling Yahuwah. Moreover, the heavenly life is characterized by increasing simplicity of manner. All outward veneer passes away because transparency desires no cover. It is genuine, sympathetic, and courteous, not from conventional motives, but because of a true grace that flows from him who dwells within. Thus, it is with this soul in union with her master, Yahusha. The meek and quiet spirit makes her unconscious of herself as she hides in her well-beloved and trusts him to manifest himself through her spontaneously and naturally, making her gracefully the servant of all. Chapter 17 the mystery of his will to make all things one in Messiah in whom we also receive the portion of our lot is but one she is the only one the choice one Ephesians 1 9 through 11 the Shulamite there are Queens concubines, maidens, without number. My dove is but one. She is the only, the choice one. Chapter 6, verse 8 through 9. The redeemed one has been brought into union with the King of Glory. She worships within the veil. Her strength is in Yahuwah, strong and mighty. He has made unto her wisdom, the wisdom of Elohim. And behind the veil of her lowly exterior, she is beholding as in a mirror the glory of Yahuwah and is being changed into the same image from glory to glory by Yahuwah spirit. She has gladly sunk her separate identity in him, for her sole wish is to have nothing of her own and to be found in him. Philippians 3 9. She is called the Shulamite. Chapter 6 verse 13. The daughter of peace, the feminine of Solomon, the prince of peace, she is identified with him in the eyes of others and shares his name. This is his name, Yahuwah of Righteousness, Jeremiah 23, 6. And she shall be called the Yahuwah of Righteousness, Jeremiah 33, 16. My dove is the only one, the choice one, says the well-beloved to the soul. He speaks to his bride, 
the choice one of the Holy Spirit seeking and preparing. They too shall be one. This is a great mystery concerning Messiah and his assembly. Ephesians 5, 31 through 32. He speaks to her as a dove who has hidden in his side the cleft rock of ages. One who is joined to him in his risen life to be increasingly conformed to his image in its purity and meekness. He says she is but one, and his language corresponds to the words in which he expressed to his father the supreme desire of his heart before he surrendered himself to the cross. That his prayer might be fulfilled, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and thou in me, perfected into one. John seventeen, twenty-two through 23. The heavenly bride will consist of many souls who have been brought into the oneness of life and spirit with the triune Elohim. Perfected into one, he said, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. John seventeen twenty one. Each soul who is one of the many who will form the heavenly bride will prove her calling and show the bride spirit by consenting to leave all to follow the Lamb whithsoever he goeth. This spirit we trace in the Song of Songs, and we also see the faithful heart assured of her union with the glorious Yahuwah. His spirit bears witness with her that she has come to Mount Sion, to the heavenly Yerushalayim, to the ecclesia of the firstborn, enrolled in heaven. One with us. O marvelous words and mystery of Elohim, can they be written of fallen sinners who have been sunk in the hole of the pit, the horrible pit of sin? The mystery of sin has been met by the mystery of Elohim. For Yahuwah Elohim manifest in the flesh, Elohim and Messiah, reconciling the world unto himself, followed by this mystery, which is Messiah in you, the hope or assurance of glory. Colossians 1.27 The well-beloved describes others in his Father's kingdom who have not yet entered into the oneness of his bride. There are souls who are queenly, noble, victorious ones. These are not like others who are half-hearted, always saying, Master, I will follow thee, but... Luke 9, 61. And yet others, maidens without number, though hidden ones, are still babes in Messiah, yet not able to bear the fellowship of his cross, or to follow him in his path of rejection and suffering. There are also companions who follow her when she is presented to the king. Psalm 45, verse 14. On the day when the voice of the multitude in heaven will say, Hallelujah, let us give glory unto him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Revelation 19, 6 through 7. And lastly, there are those who are per peculiarly called blessed, because they are bidden to the marriage supper. Meanwhile, the glorified master, Aryosha, walking in the midst of his people, rings out the call by his spirit to every blood-bought soul. He that overcometh, I will give to him to sit down with me in my throne, as I also overcame. Revelation 3.21 He that overcometh, I will write upon him the name of the city the new Yerushalayim, which cometh down out of heaven from my Elohim. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith, not to the world, but to the ecclesia, the assemblies.
Revelation 3, 12 through 13. The Illuminated Vessel of Clay. The daughters saw her and called her blessed, yea, the queens and the concubines, and they praised her, who is she that looketh forth? As the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, terrible as an army with banners? Chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. All that see them shall acknowledge them, that they are the seed which Yahuwah hath blessed. Isaiah 61, 9. The glorified Lamb has been revealed to the bridal soul. She has seen his glory as in the mount of the mighty one, while hidden in the cleft of the rock. Exodus 32:22. He has made all his goodness to pass before her, so that those around her break out into a description of her as they see her in Messiah. Without one word from her, they glorify him. They say, Who is she that looketh forth as the morning? For they see her in union with him who is the hind of the morning, the firstborn from the dead. Who is she? Just one who would say, Messiah Yahusha came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. 1 Timothy 1.15 who is she? Just one of those whom Elohim has chosen, those who are described by the Apostle Paul as foolish, weak, base, despised, nothings, but in whom Mashiach, Yahusha, has been made, wisdom from Elohim, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. 1 Corinthians 1, 27 through 30. The onlookers describe her as fair as the moon, a most appropriate description because the moon is a faithful witness, and this redeemed one is nothing else. The moon is entirely dark in herself and simply reflects faithfully the light of the sun. She remains the same above all the clouds. She moves as her sun moves wholly dependent upon his upholding power. He is her center and her all. She has nothing apart from him. If he were removed, she would sink into space, useless and helpless. Thus, it is with the soul brought into the life of Yahuwah Elohim. She is utterly dark in herself. She has no light but him resting upon the heavenly sun as her center and her all. She moves with him, and in absolute dependence upon him, above all and through all, the changing scenes of earth. With the soul's vision turned wholly toward him, her one work is to move in her orbit in the path marked out for her, in correspondence with her sun. The onlookers again describe the Shulamite as being clear as the sun, thus emphasizing the words of the well-beloved that she is comely as Yerushalayim. Chapter 6, verse 4. For the principal characteristic of the bride city is its clearness. It is said to be clear as crystal, Revelation 21, 11, transparent as glass. Revelation 21, 21. I think there's a little error here in this. Uh, it says 210. There is no 210, so I'm thinking it's Revelation 21, 21. For it is only a medium for transmitting the glory of him who is the light thereof. Revelation 21, 23. Moreover, the soul united to Yahuwah is not conscious of this clear light of Elohim shining through her. If she were to look within to know why the onlookers speak thus of her, she would be dark to herself. She is only filled with light as she is occupied with him who is her son. While full of light, Luke 11:34, she is terrible indeed to the works of darkness 
and to the prince of darkness. She is terrible as an army with banners. For clothed in the armor of light, she is one of the souls of whom it is written, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Revelation 12, 11. She becomes more and more an illuminated vessel of clay through which her master, Yahusha, will show himself again to weary hearts lying in darkness and the shadow of death. She is increasingly being prepared for the hour when her body of humiliation will be conformed to the body of his glory, according to the working whereby he is able to subject all things unto himself. This is the last chapter I will be reading. Chapter 18. Who is blind as he that is at peace with me, and blind as Yahuwah's servant? Isaiah 42, 19. The soul's failure in abiding. I went down into the garden to see the green plants, to see whether the vine budded. Before I was even aware, my soul set me among the chariots of my princely people. Chapter 6, 11 through 12. The Shulamite had now to learn the conditions of abiding in the light of her Yahuwah's countenance. She is not yet established in this degree of union, nor does she know all its special dangers or the wiles of the adversary at this stage of the spiritual life. The hidden one quickly learns how not to abide, for she says, I went down into the garden to see. This impractical experience means self-introspection, which immediately brings a cloud upon the soul. She is Yahuwah's garden. It is not her place to go down to see how Yahuwah's plants are growing. In other words, she must not look at her own experience or be occupied with how she is getting on, but she must be obediently looking unto Yahusha. Hebrews 12.2 This is her part alone. It's not without reason that Yahuwah always mentions first the eyes of the heart, for they indicate the main attitude of the soul. And upon their faithfulness depends the abiding. If thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. Matthew 6, 22. The Shulamite must learn that the single eye is blind to all else but the will of Elohim. She must be content not to see other things if she is to abide in her Yahuwah. We may also think of the garden as the believer's work with which the hidden one is deeply concerned. She wanted to see whether there was a, were signs of fruit, and so she went down into the garden. She has yet to be taught that she may not act independently of her well-beloved in the smallest matters, for little things are very great in their consequences. The right thing may be done at the wrong time. He would have her concerned in his gardens and in the budding vines, but she must not go until she is sent. She must learn to walk in step with him and to know that those who truly believe in his all-wise working are content not to make haste, Isaiah 28, 16, but to await his will. The Shulamite tells us frankly what she did and how quickly she found out her mistake. Possibly the chorus of the onlookers distracted her a little from the still small voice of her master, Yahusha. Whatever the cause and the assurance of her union with him, probably without inquiring at his mouth, she went down to have a look at how things were going on in the work. Maybe it was because of her natural activity and energy that she was one of those souls so difficult to bring into the stillness and rest of Elohim. Just a peep, she said to herself. And before she knew it, she found herself swept into a whirl that she likens to chariots. She had missed Yahuwah's path and had lost her deep centered calm. But who are the princely people who were the immediate cause of this? Possibly souls knit to her in a special spiritual tie, her own children, 
who have become princely souls, Psalm 45:16, or others who had been changed from Jacob's to Israel's, spiritual princes having power. O oh, oh soul, you will have to learn to be both blind and deaf if you are to walk continuously in the will of your Elohim and thus to abide in the holiest of all. The Call to the Shulamite Return, return, O Shulamite, return, return that we may look upon thee. Chapter 6, verse 13. The soul united to Yahuwah is made quickly conscious of a step out of his will and is so readily obedient that to see her mistake is to retrace that step without hesitation. And to retrace means an immediate confession of sin and restoration through the precious blood of Yahusha, the Messiah. The language of this call shows us that the Shulamite has fled to her hiding place in the sanctuary of Elohim. She could not delay a moment. She must get back into step with her beloved, whatever it means. She is hidden secretly in his pavilion from the clamor of tongues that follow her. Return, return, that we may look upon thee. They who call are loath to lose her and are in danger of clinging to the vessel illuminated by her master. For indwelt by him, she is pressed upon by the multitude with their needs. She is sought out, a city not forsaken. Isaiah sixty two twelve. The beloved has fulfilled his promise, and thy life shall be clearer then the noonday, yea, many shall make suit unto thee. Job eleven seventeen through 19. The bridegroom's question. Why, why will ye look upon the Shulamite as upon the dance of Mahanaim, or two companies? Chapter 6, verse 13. The well-beloved replies to these souls on behalf of his hidden one, because all things are named and laid open before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Hebrews 4.13. He asks a question. Why will ye look upon the Shulamite? What are your motives? Eager souls? Do you want the Shulamite or the Shulamite's master, her redeemer, her Yahusha? He gently rebukes that element of the earth life which his eyes of fire behold, as he adds, why, why will you look upon the Shulamite as upon the dance of Manane? His word is quick and powerful and pierces to the dividing of soul and spirit and is quick to discern the thoughts and intents of the heart. Hebrews 4.12 Their desire to look upon this Elohim possessed one is not wholly pure. She is attractive to them in some measure because she pleases their eyes and gives them pleasure. The word Mahanaim means two hosts, and it was a name given by Jacob to the place where the angels of Elohim met him. Genesis 32, 1 and 2, Why will you look upon the Shulamite as upon two hosts of angels? Does the well-beloved see the eager hearts thinking of her? Above that which is written, St. Paul said he would not speak of the glory of the revelations of Messiah to him, lest any man should account of me above that which hath seeth me to be. 2 Corinthians 12, 6. A sinner saved by grace. This may be also the reply of the soul to the call return. In either case, she is one with her Yahusha. She has fled to her hiding place in him, and if she speaks, it is because she has been sent by her beloved with the question that lays bare the hearts of the eager ones who desire, who desired her to return. That pretty much concludes Thy Hidden Ones by Jesse Penn Lewis. I will be doing part six not next Wednesday, but probably the following Wednesday, because I have another 
study that I, that the Holy Spirit led me into. It's one of the Psalms. I think it might be Psalm 130, a deeper dive into Psalm 130. So I'm hoping to get that going next Wednesday. Well, for those who have been listening to these, uh, to this, basically, I would call it an audio book. <laughs> Even though I'm reading from the book, I've, this has turned into an audio book of Thy Hidden Ones by Jesse Penn Lewis. It has been a blessing for me to read it. And uh, for those who um, have not listened to the other four parts, Please take the time if you are able to do so. I believe you will be very blessed. Well, until we all do come together again, in the name of our most glorious and precious and beloved Yahusha the Messiah, I bid you all Shalom. <laughs>